we're going to jump into engineering. This is kind of uh, geek stuff that really gets my motor running. I get excited about the engineering side of it. Um, so, you know, we talked about installation. We talked about a lot of the block properties, and this is where we kind of tie it all together, talk about some of the the real brain power that goes behind these systems and into the planning and the R&D and all this other stuff. So uh, if you are taking the NCMA test, this is also the section of the seminars you want to pay close attention to. I'll try to earmark some of the stuff here as we go along if you're going to take the NCMA test that I know you're going to find on that test. So the first part here is how all these wall components work together. We've talked about all the different styles of block we have. We've talked about pins, geogrid, uh, drain rock, you know, backfill, how important compaction is, base material, all that stuff. I had a guy uh, at break ask me if I use three-quarter clear under my retaining walls. Most of the time I do. I, I think uh, it's, it's a, you know, more solid base. It's going to hold less moisture, less fines, less movement. It is a little bit trickier, a little bit harder. But to me, that's a worthwhile investment. So, um, you know, we've kind of covered all, this, all these different facets and how stuff works together. Now what we're going to do is try to turn you guys not into engineers, but into somebody that can look at a problem. Some of you guys looking out here, I can tell some of you are owners. Some of you might be foremen. Some of you might be, uh, you know, guys that are going to be putting these walls in and working on them. It's important for all those different levels to be able to identify some of these uh, variables that are going to change your game plan dramatically. Uh, I own a company and I'm just a guy. I make mistakes, believe it or not. Ask my wife. I screw up all the time. You know, so like I really appreciate having a foreman that's trained in that can identify some of this stuff if I miss something. You know, so it's, it really is. It's nice to have redundancy and, and, and a layered approach to putting these walls in because if you've ever had one fall down, and had to rebuild it, you only want to do that once in your life and you don't even want to do it once. Trust me, it sucks. So build the wall right the first time, uh, especially on large walls. Large walls can put small companies out of business pretty quick if you don't put them up exactly right. So uh, know when to call an engineer. We're going to talk about all these things. I'm going to glaze over it because we've kind of talked about you know, unit properties. We know we've got a block that weighs 82 pounds. It's solid concrete. It's got a bunch of little holes in it for the pins. It's got some, uh, some, some cut lines or some, some break lines. And if you, if you look at these block, you can see on the back, there's that uh, rivet or that, that indent right there. That's meant to take your chisel and that's how you're actually going to split the block when you go to split it in half. So there's a lot of little lines on the Versalock block. Uh, a lot of them aren't, aren't worth really, you know, running through and talking about a whole lot, but a lot of stuff going on. And uh, we've talked about that. We've talked about GeoGrid. We're going to talk a little bit more in depth about grid because, <clears throat> you know, just like everything else, I mean, I've had guys at these seminars. I mean, I do them all over. I do them in Davenport, Iowa, and, you know, Kansas City and, you know, St. Louis. I've heard some crazy stuff. Some guys think that it's cheaper to cut metal rebar and use that as a pin than pay the 25 cents for a, a pre-manufactured engineered pin. Um, I've seen guys use crazy stuff for GeoGrid, you know? Like, some guys think that the orange silt fencing is gonna work for GeoGrid because what the hell, it's gonna tie everything together and I'm gonna compact and do everything right. Don't use silt fence for GeoGrid. Uh, it's gotta be, a very specific strength. So, so make sure that you're not, you know, subbing stuff in, save a few bucks, do it the right way. Talk about the base, the beginning of every wall. Uh, you know, you always build from the ground up, so your wall's only going to be as good as your base material and your compaction and your, your uh, level on, on that base course. You want to make sure that we're basing out proper drainage. I would have put drainage at the top. I think drainage is probably the number one thing that I've gotten callbacks for. Uh, I've had projects that, you know, my God, you, if, you, if you're not out there when it's downpouring, you would never know that all the rain funnels off the roof 200 yards away and hits this little drain swale and it just ends up right behind where you're going to build your wall. Some of that stuff is just damn near impossible to see in foresight, to, to see it coming, right? So try to think about drainage, try to, you know, Identify downspouts and do what you can. Always do your diligence when it comes to keeping water away from your wall. If you can, if you can't, you know, plan for it, right? Maybe that means an extra drain tile or an extra foot of drain rock uh, behind your retaining wall. 
Compaction, super important. Again, if you don't compact, Mother Nature is going to do it for you, and she doesn't care if you have to come back and rebuild the wall. So make sure that you're compacting uh, and, and doing extra diligence in that way. Understanding soils is huge. Uh, this is something that when I was first starting out, I, I probably underestimated the importance of, like, what's it matter? It's dirt, I'm digging a hole in dirt. It's dirt here, it's dirt there. It doesn't matter, it's dirt everywhere. So being able to identify the difference between uh, a, a really compact, dense clay and a nice, sandy, loamy soil makes a world of difference to us because that's what we're building on at the end of the day. Even though we've got our six inch gravel pad, you know, the substrate is what's really important. So being able to identify the differences between soils, it's just another component that's gonna help you decide whether you need to get an engineer involved or if you can, you know, maybe use the VersaLock pre-engineering software or if you can just go by a pre-canned, you know, the four foot rule, right? But uh, if you're not able to identify the soils, it's gonna be a long road to hoe. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Unit properties, we've, we've gone through all this, about 125 pounds per square foot at the wall face. Uh, this whole sh uh, slide right here is, is all gonna be on that NCMA test. Uh, it exceeds ASTM C1372 industry standards. Uh, it's all, you know, jargon, tech jargon for uh, it's, it's this hard and it has this much absorption. And uh, how, how many of you guys are familiar with concrete absorption and how that's tested and how, why that matters? So if you have a concrete block, that weighs 82 pounds dry. What they do to test uh, moisture content or absorption is they literally will put that block into a tub of water for 24 hours. They weigh it. Before they put it in, they weigh it when they take it out. If that block weighs 84 pounds when it comes out, it's absorbed two pounds of moisture. That's a lot of water to absorb, but we know concrete's porous and we know that concrete does absorb moisture. So every concrete has an absorption rate. That's also why you see some of the older retaining wall blocks, like some of the original Keystone, they, they tend to spald so bad. You know, you see the caps cracking apart and the blocks cracking apart. That's because that concrete has a really high absorption rate. It's absorbing a lot of moisture. So it's much more likely to crack and spald. <clears throat> uh, you know, stable stability, it's got that two to one ratio. I know I talked about that with tiered walls where you want uh, twice the height of the wall between the tiers is extremely important. Well, that's one thing about the VersaLock block in its design is that it's got that two to one ratio. It's 12 inches deep, six inches high. So it's a very stable block. Uh, and that's one more reason that we can build up to four feet in perfect conditions. So we've seen this, the pinning. Uh, you gotta make sure that that pin goes all the way through. It get, it's gotta get seated, you know, right, right in here. You want that shouldn't stick out at all, because if that pin sticks out a little bit on the top of the block, it's gonna set the next row off. It's the same thing we were talking about with the pebble. Uh, it's, it's just gonna be something that you can try to fix, you can try to put a Band-Aid on a bullet hole, so to speak, but you're never gonna get it exactly the way you want it. So make sure you get those pins fully seated. Friction contributes to strength. So what that's talking about is the weight of the block, right? The block weighs 82 pounds. Uh, that, that weight is, is a ton of friction. It's not enough to eliminate horizontal migration or in other words, blocks slipping around on each other. That's why we need that physical uh, interlock or that pin to be in there. Otherwise, this block will slide back and forth. You get a certain amount of friction resistance, like a certain amount, but it's not enough to hold a retaining wall up. So uh, there are situations maybe where you can't pin. If you're going directly vertical, I've seen guys try. It's charge double. If you're gonna to try to build a straight vertical pinned wall, charge double. You gotta glue some of that stuff, right? You gotta trust in, in the uh, block adhesive. And the block adhesive that they're selling these days is so strong that if you've ever had to pull a wall apart, you know it, you're gonna break capstones and block probably before you get that glue to crack apart. It's really tough stuff. So uh, you can trust glue for, the, for some of that interlock as long as you're not dealing with an engineered wall that has a uh, spec for some other physical connection, so. Some have clips, you know, lips, shear keys, whatever. It's all the same thing. It's all preventing uh, horizontal migration or slippage sliding. So some sort of interlock is required there. Geogrid works purely on friction. Geogrid's gonna slap or sandwich in between the blocks. 
You're depending completely on the weight of the block above the geo grid to lock it in place. And then you're depending on your compaction behind the wall in that uh, drain rock and the backfill material. So when you've got a, a wall that requires grid, if the engineer specs six foot grid lengths, I would dig back seven feet behind that retaining wall so that I got enough room because you can't just bench cut in and slide your geo grid in. You just want to do a full excavation. That way you can compact behind it. Maybe you need to do a soil amendment. Maybe you've got pure clay back there and you got to mix some sand in there, you know, whatever it is. So you're going to have to cut back. That way you can roll your grid lengths back. There are different gradations and styles of geo grid. This is going to be, uh, this graphic right here, this is showing us what most of the higher grade grids are. You do not roll it along the length of the wall because like a, a 3.0 is going to have a direction of strength. So if you just go out and you just roll it down the length of the wall, your geo grid's pointless. You wasted your time and your money doing it. It's not going to lock in. It's not going to have the strength and the cohesion to hold everything together. So you do have to roll it back and cut it. The reason that's nice is because imagine doing a curved wall and then you're going to end up with those ripples where you try to make the, the curves or the radiuses. So doing it this way seems like it's a lot of extra work, but I think in most cases, you know, when you're doing longer walls, you're going to have some kind of a curve. You want to make sure that you're rolling it back and that the geo grid is not on the geo grid. So if you're doing an inside radius and your grid lengths come back like that and make an X, you're gonna have to put some soil or some rock or some material in there to keep your, your geo grid separated by, you know, I think they say about an inch and a half. Because it is just a, it's a synthetic polymer, it's slippery, it won't lock up. So the only way that geo grid's gonna lock up is if you get it locked into soil, you want those rocks to get in those little crevices and just hold everything together really well. So there's our first grid length. Now this is by no, no means, don't look at this and be like, oh, well, if I'm building a four foot wall, I just need one you know, grid length right there out after the third row. This is just an example. Uh, engineer or pre-engineering software is gonna tell you where those grid lengths need to go exactly. And the side profile should look something like, you know, and I know I'm going way back to this morning, but that ziggurat thing, right? Should look something like that, where you actually see the grid lengths in there, kind of holding things together. And believe it or not, the engineers say that if you do your geo grid properly, you can actually remove the block from the face and that hillside's gonna be sustainable. So the geo grid does a lot of work as far as stabilizing the soil behind the wall and reducing the load on your wall, which means less warranty work. Warranty work, you're not making money, it's free work, so just you avoid that at all costs. <clears throat> um, compacted road base. For the base, how many guys using limestone? How many guys use road base, recon? I use recon because I think the asphalt is a really good binder. I like, this, I like the asphalt in there instead of the stone dust. Uh, you know, you can use clear rock too, but road base or recon, recycle concrete, I think I pay like eight bucks a ton for it or something. It's super cheap stuff and, you know, I'm always looking for a way to sell my services. So if I'm working for somebody that I, you know, I walk up and I see a big, you know, think green yard sign or something like that, and I can tell that these people are, you know, they got rain barrels and all that stuff. Well, guess what? We use a green base material. It's recycled 100%. You know, this is the old Highway 36, whatever. You know, so nothing's going to waste. We're not using a new product. It's just another thing. If you're selling out there, think about ways to, to kind of be creative and, and, and round some of those corners off a little bit. It's cheaper. It does the same thing. Asphalt's a great binder. I've never run into problems substituting recon for limestone in class five or class two. Six inch base, uh, the 24 inch depth is based purely on a, a 12 inch deep block. If you're using uh, one of these Rosetta blocks that's two feet deep, you want to have at least three foot for your base. You want to have at least six inches of additional base material in the front and the back of your base row block. So again, if it's, if it's a 12, 12 inch deep block, you're going to go 24 deep with your base. If it's 
wider, like some of the Rosetta stuff is, you're gonna go wider with your base. I've had some blocks that, you know, come in at like 30 inches deep. So, you know, I just, I'll go in with a skid steer bucket and make a five foot swath. And, and uh, that also gives you the, the leeway where, you know, if you are doing curves and you're not completely sure, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of wiggle room where the curve's gonna start, where it's gonna stop. Well, it gives you that extra flexibility, you know, doing a little bit of extra base on the front and the back, the money that you're gonna spend at eight bucks a ton, it's, it's well worth it to get that flexibility and not have to have, you know, Joe and Joe go and redig the base and then repack it in. It's just, that's such a killer. So uh, set your base up, overbuild, overbuild, right? Always overbuild. I've never seen anybody do this with the weak unreinforced concrete, you know, low PSI concrete. Uh, that's something that I would only do if it was specifically specified by an engineer. So has anybody used low PSI concrete? That's usually the answer I get. It's just not something that, that's uh, very common in the industry. I've, a couple times I've had a few guys raise their hands and I'm like, why do you do it? And they're like, it's just the way I do it. So, all right, fair enough, whatever. I'm old school too with some stuff, so that's cool. But Class five, recon, compacted, that is the NCMA standard. So this is an interesting one here. Uh, this is talking about, you know, we talked about toe slope, right? How you have to backfill the base of your wall. You don't want it to bulge out and push out. This again, this is like a perfect case scenario, right? You've got great soils, it's sandy, it's not, you know, dense clay. Uh, but the spec that the engineers have said is that with no toe slope, no load slope, no surcharge, you need to have about 10% of the wall embedded. So if you got a 10 foot wall, you need a foot to be underground. So you're gonna burn that block up. If you got a 20 foot wall, two feet. And again, that changes with soil conditions, it changes with slope conditions, loads, surcharges. You know, we talk about dead loads, live loads, there's all this stuff, right? That's why again, it was, we don't need to be engineers, we just need to know when to call one. But as a general rule, one-tenth the height of the wall is gonna be your embedment depth. If you have a toe slope, one-seventh. So you can see how, that, how much that affects it. 10-foot wall, you're burying an extra row and a half a block. You don't wanna put that in for free, you know? And, and that's another thing with the estimating software that we'll talk about. It's really easy as you're drawing up plans. Like, I use a 3D CAD program. So when I'm looking at my wall and I'm doing my sales presentation, you know, my wall might be 100 feet long and four feet tall. I'm not charging for 400 square feet. I'm charging for 500 square feet because I know I have to embed that bottom foot. So always be, you know, kind of thinking about that when you're bidding these projects. And that's another reason to use this software. It's a great tool. Gets you to think about things that, that sometimes you would miss. So uh, we'll go over that after engineering. So again, drainage, uh, you know, P-Rock, I, I can't tell you how many walls I've torn apart that have P-Rock behind it. And I mean, hey, at least they were using drainage. You know, it's probably better than nothing, but uh, P-Rock is not what you wanna use behind a retaining wall. You wanna have a three quarter clear. A lot of guys like using dolomite because dolomite's a little harder than limestone. Uh, there is a, a spec that we'll get to here that, you know, it's like 0.05% of your drainage backfill can be, uh, fines, fine particulate that holds moisture. Uh, you really need the majority of it, 99.995% to be open graded clear rock. And that's just, I always kind of think about, uh, what was that old show, had the Plinko game? That's kind of what your drain rock is supposed to do with the water. Because if you have a concentrated flow coming in behind your wall, you want that concentrated flow to dissipate through your drain rock. So it's kind of like that Plinko game. You know, they drop the disc down, it bounces all over the place. You never know where it's gonna end up. But you know that that water is gonna get broken up and you're not gonna get a concentrated flow that's gonna wash out part of your base or freeze and bow out one specific part of your wall. So. Always be thinking about water, drainage, 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 and compaction, massive uh, importance there. You can see up here, that's that foot, and that's why on that, on that one picture, uh, we were looking at the installation, I said, I bet you that's the top of the wall, even though it didn't look like it was full height, because we had that virgin soil coming all the way up to the back here. You wanna make sure that you have that so that the water coming down this hill doesn't run down into your drain stack and saturate that. 
So that way, the idea is that the water is going to flow over the capstone and down the face of the wall. So pretty simple, uh, pretty simple uh, engineering technique there. But it, again, eliminating water flow or, or uh, concentrated flow behind the wall is, is massively important. So there we go. It's 5%. 5% fine soils, if you're taking the NCMA test, make note of that. Uh, that means 95% completely permeable. So that's the uh, NCMA statistic for drain rock. That's what they want to see. 12 inches thick or 12 inches deep. This used to always kill me because, you know, as you're digging a hole, it's never straight vertical. And, you know, how am I going to get exactly 12 inches? We'll just overdo it. You know, you'd rather have 18 inches in some spots than have, you know, six inches in some spots. So overdo it a little bit. You don't want to use a filter fabric, and this is one thing I, I saw guys doing for a long time. You don't want a filter fabric here behind your block, directly behind your block, because what's going to eventually happen is fines are going to wash through there and get filtered into that fabric, and wherever you get a concentration, fines, you're going to have a concentration of, of standing water or moisture. So I do put filter fabric between my rock and my soil. So I'll, I'll make like a rock burrito here and I'll protect that, that drain rock from getting all the fines washing into it, but I never put it directly behind the block right there. Sometimes I'll wrap my base too, it's just extra cheap insurance. Um, but you want to make sure that you keep your drain rock clean, 12 inches minimum. Four inch perforated drain pipe. If it's not perforated, it's not doing anything for you. Uh, you got to make sure you get the right drain pipe, you know, and <clears throat> supply chain stuff and all that. Sometimes it's hard to find the, the pipe that's got a sock on it. Socked or not socked doesn't matter to the NCMA, so it doesn't matter to me necessarily. I'll use either one, whatever I can get my hands on, uh, as long as it's perforated. So what it's saying here when it says drain rock level with finished grade, it's actually talking about base grade. So uh, you can see the bottom of the drain stack here is about even with grade, and that's, that's pretty much what you want. If I, was gonna, if I was gonna err on one side or the other, I'd rather have this drain rock be a little bit higher, just so that I know that as the water comes down this stack, it's gonna come out through the face of the wall, but you want it level, or, or a little bit higher then. Uh, if you're taking the test, the answer is gonna be level, not higher, but um, that's the main thing there is that you're getting drainage and you're not having water sit behind the wall and uh, freeze up on you at some point. So we talked about using clear rock and this is a great example of that. This looks probably more like the side view that CJ had for his uh, Rosetta stuff. There's no separation here. We're just letting that water come down I hate this picture because it's got the drain pipe below base grade. I don't know how you would ever daylight that pipe. It's impossible. So you would have to have that pipe elevated a little bit unless you got an opportunity where the yard's crowned and you can daylight it somehow like that. But um, just know that you know if you're gonna do a drain tile or a drain pipe like that, it's gotta come out to daylight. You can't just let that pipe run into uh, soil because again, it's gonna create an area that's saturated, right? It's always going to be wet. But the drain rock can be part of the base. And there's advantages and disadvantages to doing this. It's harder to set up and get it perfectly level. You can't screed it back the same way because it's three quarter inch rock. It's just harder to do. Um, <clears throat> it's more expensive. Three quarter clear is, you know, I don't know what, 35, 40 bucks a ton. I can't remember what it is. Depends on where you are, but it's expensive. It's way more expensive than using like a recon. So, um, you know, cost is a consideration. The nice thing about using three quarter clear is that it doesn't settle. So if you dump a pile of three quarter clear rock on the ground in front of you, it's like 85% compacted, right? It fits together, it locks together. Whereas if it's soil or dirt, it might settle 20%. So. Uh, when you order a yard of this, you get a full yard worth of volume. If you order a yard of class two or three quarter minus, by the time you've compacted that yard, you might have between a half and two thirds of a yard. So it's, you know, it's, it is more expensive, but it it's also makes it a little bit easier where you don't have to over order and guess, I guess, is, is kind of how I'd put that. So 
Uh, advantages and disadvantages, some guys love it, some guys hate it. I'm kind of middle of the road, I've used it, I like it. I don't use it on every job, but I do use it on most, I would say. Sometimes for cord systems, because you'd have that drain stack coming through the middle of the block, right? So that might be a situation where you'd want to use a clear graded base so that you're not having those block pockets fill up with water down there when they hit that impermeable class five that you compacted. So once that class five's packed in there, it's almost like concrete, right? And again, this is a uh, graphic I'm not in love with because the drain pipe is below the water line. I don't know why you'd do that. Um, engineer might spec it for some reason that I don't understand. It's above, above my pay grade, I guess. But uh, again, you're going to have to daylight that pipe down there somehow. So what we're seeing here, though, is exactly what I was describing to you earlier. So this dotted line here, that's our filter fabric, right? And again, you can see, you know, if you had it running right up the back of the block, you'd have to do the opposite sort of curve because you got your geogrid coming back. And that's what we see here is that it's been folded over. We're kind of making that rock burrito. But what it's really doing is it's keeping your base material clean and pure. Or your, sorry, your drainage material, not your base. Uh, I would never do something like this unless it was specced by an engineer. Uh, having a chimney drain like that as a, as a first line of defense against water, that's something that is not going to be in the Versalock pre-engineering software. It's just something that I would trust an engineer to spec, and I, I wouldn't try to reinvent the wheel myself with, with uh, doing that chimney drain. But uh, what it's showing you is just with a water line application like this, you have to do some extra diligence, right? So you just got to think about it know that your base of your wall is always going to be wet. That's going to make a difference in the way it moves. You know, it's always going to have moisture in it. When it freezes, it's going to be extra uh, tension on it. So when you have a shoreline application like this, get in touch with your uh, geotech engineer. Let them help you out a little bit. And if you don't have one that you've been working with, talk to your sales rep. These guys know everybody in the industry. Uh, Kelly's been doing this almost as long as I've been alive, probably, and we've got Joe and years and years and years of experience. So if, if you need a good reference for a geotech engineer, ask your sales rep. I'm sure they can help hook you up. All right, so again, we're diverting water from, away from the back of the wall. That way we're not pushing water in behind it. Special engineering for groundwater applications. Um, obviously, wet soil weighs more than dry soil. Right? It's just simple, basic, common sense. But you got to think about that because when your wall's wet, you have to build that wall to protect against the worst case scenario, not the best case scenario. Because worst case scenarios are inevitable. It's going to happen eventually. So build it for the worst case scenario. If you build for the best case scenario, the worst case will wipe you out. So make sure that you are overbuilding when it comes to uh, uh, holding back that hydrostatic pressure. This is what kills most retaining walls. Most retaining walls go down during a really heavy rainfall, you know. Maybe it takes five, ten years of freeze-thaw cycles, and every single year it freezes, it pushes that wall out just a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. It never settles back, right? So eventually the top of your wall may have migrated four to six inches. You didn't even realize it because it's still in line. But hydrostatic pressure is, is probably the number one serial killer of all retaining walls. So again, charts are assuming that you're managing your back for, or uh, your water, that you're not allowing it to build up. This is a, a good picture of what can happen if you have like a concentrated flow. All the water off a parking lot, you know, Walmart parking lots, six acres, whatever, they, whatever it is. Tons of water shooting right into that one spot, you know, and so it's washed out all the fine particulate behind the wall, and then you've got asphalt draining in, and this is like a domino effect. Once it looks like this, you're done. It's gonna keep happening, it's not gonna fix itself, it's gonna get worse and worse and worse. So, uh, poor drainage is always gonna be a killer. So we're gonna talk a little bit about soils, uh, fee angles, shear planes. Again, this is one really important part of, of being able to identify how to build a wall, how far you need to go with your embedment, uh, geogrid lengths, all that stuff. And that's why some big commercial jobs, you'll hear uh, you know, contractors say that they're gonna have a boring test done, right? They're gonna have somebody come out, 
dig down, you know, whatever it is. They use one of those little tube things. They'll go down like six feet, eight feet, whatever the application requires. They'll test the soil to see what's down two feet deep, right? Because you don't know until you dig a hole. But that's why these uh, soils are so important because if you don't do that test, you build on the wrong soil, your wall's gonna fail. So you gotta think about how soils are gonna affect whatever you're building on. Soils matter, okay, compaction. Compacted soils, the wall, we talked about that, how if you're using GeoGrid, the compacted material, we call it reinforced backfill. The reinforced backfill is actually gonna become part of the structural integrity of the wall. So uh, that's how powerful this GeoGrid stuff is. This is all really good information for test takers. Um, Think about your compaction equipment. Again, you know, if you got a little whacker, that's maybe two, three inches. If you're using a big roller compactor, it might be six, eight, ten. So you got to know what you're using. Uh, gauge your tool to your application and vice versa. Uh, in other words, you know, for a two foot tall wall, I would never think about bringing in that huge roller compactor. I'd use my little whacker. It's just more work because you got to go in two or three inch lifts instead of eight or ten. But um, again, Keep the lifts thin, max six to eight, I guess they're saying with the roller, that little packer again, two to three. Uh, standard proctor is, is a term used for a material that's been compacted as much as you can possibly do it. So, you know, you, you put it in a, a vacuum, right? Put a certain soil into a vacuum and it gets compressed down. Once it reaches a point where it can no longer compress, that's 100% standard proctor. They want your reinforced backfill to be compacted to 95% standard proctor. Um, there are density, you know, you can use a, a density tester, uh, you know, and, and get super scientific with it. Does anybody have a trick, a quick, easy way to tell if your backfill is compacted enough? Take a 10 inch spike and try to pound it in. You know, that's, that's how we test our patio bases too. We wanna make sure that you gotta work. You know, if you got a, a six pound maul or something like that, that when you go to pound that stake in, it doesn't just slide in easy. It's gotta be a hard push, right? You wanna have to whack that thing. And that's just like a cheap, nasty field test, right? That's not something that you would ever use uh, on an engineered spec. But if you're field testing guys and you come out, you know, say you're the foreman or you're the owner, and you come out and you look at the material and you're like, dude, that does not look packed. It's just a quick way to go and prove and say, look, I, I know you didn't compact that properly because look at this spike just sticks right in there. So it's just a cheap, nasty field test. Heavy equipment, again, that's gonna be on the test, three feet back from the wall face, or I'm sorry, from the back of the wall, not from the, or no, that is wall face. The spec is wall face. So uh, three feet from the face of the wall, so that would actually be two feet from the back of these blocks because they're 12 inches deep. So uh, if you are taking the NCMA test, I know that is something that's gonna be on there. Proper moisture content, also extremely important. If you have saturated soil, you wouldn't think about it, but like, when dirt's saturated, a lot of that volume becomes water, you know, and that's why it gets so much heavier because water weighs more than dirt. So when you have a saturated soil, even though you think it's compacted, once it dries, you're gonna lose a lot of that volume. So you gotta make sure that your soil's not too dry and that it's not too wet. Uh, it really does make a difference having some level of uniformity uh, when it comes to moisture content. jump through all these. So I said, you know, several times, if you don't compact and do it yourself, Mother Nature's gonna do it for you. It's probably gonna look something like that. You know, Mother Nature doesn't care. She's just gonna do what she does. So, you know, you end up with this little area that dives right down behind the back of the wall. And eventually, you're gonna get washout to the point where it starts looking like this. And I've seen a thousand retaining walls that look like this where the top foot of the wall is exposed behind it, right? You can, in, in, in the case of Versalock, you can see the backs of the blocks. Well, that's because they didn't compact behind the wall. So it's, it's unsightly, it's ugly, it changes the entire grade of the yard. It probably screws up the water management plan that the, uh, that the city planner had originally with the drain swales, you know, make sure that the yard is, is able to, to manage the amount of water that's coming off the roof and the driveway. Uh, so make sure that you're compacting behind these walls. 
And the other thing about not compacting, and that's a great point at the bottom, is loose soil absorbs more water than compacted soil. Compacted soil is more likely to let water run off over the top of it, where loose soil is like a sponge, right? It's just gonna suck all that water up. This is a smiling wall, and we always say a smiling wall is not a happy wall, right? And it's because what's happened is it's bowed out in the middle. Anybody want to guess what maybe the, one of the main contributing factors is to this wall's failure? Just looking at it, if I had to guess, I would guess that it wasn't properly compacted. And the reason I say that is because you're seeing a blowout about halfway up and then the top half is leaning back. That means that a lot of the soil behind there on that top half has come down, it's caused a bow in the center of the wall and because it's not, the top of the wall is not properly uh, supported, it's starting to lean back. And once a wall starts to hit this point, you can't drive a skid steer into it and straighten it out. Uh, <laughs> I've seen guys try all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, and even uh, uh, screw, screw pylons like they use for uh, basement foundations. I saw a truck out there, it looks like, uh, one of you guys, I'm not sure who it is, one of you guys does those helical coil footings, right? You know, you're not, you're not gonna be able to helical coil this wall back into being straight and true. Uh, there's just no way to fix it. You tear it down, you fix it, and then you file for bankruptcy. And you can see why, I mean, that's a huge wall, right? It's big enough, most companies can't absorb that kind of labor to go out and fix that. It's almost a point where you make an insurance claim, I don't know what you do, I've never had this situation come up in my own personal life, but this looks like an absolute nightmare. So, and it was just because, you know, they used the right block, they probably used GeoGrid. As the top of the wall was tipping back, if they didn't properly compact, that GeoGrid's starting to work against them because it's like having somebody pull on the top of the wall, right? That grid is, is getting locked into the, the uh, uh, reinforced material and the drain rock, and all that friction is actually pulling the top of the wall down. So even though they did everything else right, they screwed the pooch on compaction, and massive failure was the result. So again, we talk about soils um, and how important they are. Here's kind of what you would see in the field, right? I've never seen something like the top. I mean, that's like almost base material, you know, that's, uh, I live in the South Metro in Lakeville, it's all clay down there, but, but I have seen stuff like this second picture, you know, and that's extremely gravel rich soil there. That's like the kind of stuff that you'd expect to almost see at an old rock quarry. But down below it there, that's maybe more typical where it's just a rocky, sandy, loamy soil. Um, gravel and sand, Awesome, that's what we'd call ideal conditions. So when we talk about a wall being four feet tall, uh, in perfect conditions, that's perfect conditions. Sand and uh, some, some level of aggregate. Imperfect conditions that aren't gonna allow you to build a wall four feet tall unreinforced are stuff like this. This red clay, um, nasty, nasty stuff, right? You can make a ball out of it. It's rock hard concrete when it's dry and then when it gets wet, it's like a diesel motor oil. It's just slippery and nasty stuff. Uh, that right there, you're gonna have to make some extra consideration for, you know, whether it be a couple layers of grid, maybe you're gonna wrap your base material as a, an extra uh, protection against letting those fine particulates uh, reduce the structural integrity of your base. So when you see soils like that, uh, know that that's a red flag, and, and that's kind of how you start to identify when you need an engineer, right? One red flag, eh, two red flags, eh, three red flags, four red flags, okay, I, I need an engineer on site to look at this, right? So that's all we're doing is kind of creating a threshold for those red flags. Um, this material here, you know, same thing, really thick, loamy, lumpy clay. Again, that's gonna change the dynamic of your wall you're not gonna be able to go four feet unreinforced. All right, talk about the drainage properties of these different materials. And again, I, you know, I use the uh, Plinko example, but you can kind of see what it is in real life. It's just taking a concentrated flow and dissipating it out, right? That way you don't have to worry about erosion. You don't have to worry about it holding water and freezing and freeze heave and, and all these other issues that come along with fine particulate soils. 
So what we want is angular mixed sizes. That's going to make it structural. Also make it easy to compact. And like I said, when you dump a, a bucket of three quarter clear on the ground, it's like, I don't know what is 90% or something compacted. You know, it's already compacted because it's so angular. So if you're using mixed size angular rock, it's already going to be more structural, easier to compact, and it's not going to hold water. So spend the money on the right backfill. This is what you don't want to see, fine soils. So, you know, you saw how the other, the, the water droplet kind of came through and dissipated out. Here we're seeing this turn into a sponge and all those little teeny platelets are starting to kind of roll around like little ball bearings. That's what makes it so slippery. That's why you can't stay on your feet. You know, no matter how good your boots are, you're just going to be slipping and sliding, skid steers sliding down hills. I mean, I've, I've had it all happen. Uh, one time I was sliding down a hill and I had to get the forks up like a scorpion and <laughs> stick them down into the, the hillside to, to keep the skid steer from sliding down into somebody's house. Uh, and this is the kind of material that's really dangerous to work in when it's wet. So be able to identify that. You know, sometimes we used to actually set pallets up and stuff. You know, we'd walk on pallets instead of walking around in the clay and the mud. So uh, if you're... Don't do it with pallets that have deposits on them, but the paver pallets you can do it with. Um, <laughs> it, it wrecks pallets real fast, but it does keep your feet dry and it keeps your, your, your work environment probably a little safer. Extremely sensitive to changes in water content because it absorbs everything, it doesn't drain, it doesn't breathe, it's just stagnant. So once the water gets in there, it takes a long time to dry out. And this is probably the best graphic I've ever seen to explain the angle of fee. Uh, I'm sure all you guys have been into rock quarries and you've seen the different piles and you may or may not have noticed that <clears throat> some rocks, like uh, say a, a pea rock, they're gonna be angled like this. And a more angular, like a three quarter clear, might be angled like this. It's, it's steeper slope on the sides, right? Well, that's the angle of fee that we're gonna talk about or shear plane or failure plane. Again, it goes by many names, but it's a great example of what that means. And the reason it's so important to us is because that's what you would call a sustainable slope. That's never gonna erode, it's never gonna wash out. It's the side of a hill, it's the side of a mountain, whatever. That's why in Minnesota, uh, you have to have a three to one uh, ratio or you need a retaining wall, especially on new properties. Like sometimes you get called in to bid a retaining wall on a brand new house. It's because they couldn't get their certificate of occupancy because they had greater than a three to one slope on the walkout hill or whatever it might be. But that's because that's the sustainable slope or the angle of fee of most, most ground material in Minnesota and you know, heavy clay. But that's what we're talking about and that's why we need our grid lengths to cut back into that angle because that is where you're getting your strength. That material's locked in, it's not moving anywhere, it's not sliding around on you like the rest of the stuff. So there we go, fee angle, friction angle, failure angle, shear angles, it goes by many names, the same thing. Silt and clay, 26 to 30 degrees. So, you know, you're seeing a, a, a fairly gradual slope there. Sand and gravel gets a little bit steeper and the reason, again, that we want sand and gravel is because look at how much extra space that gives us to get our grid lengths back there, right? So it you know, might be at the top two, three feet difference in grid lengths because the grid can get back and it can get into that fee angle and into that sustainable slope. And that's what we need to lock into in order to hold our wall vertical. Okay, so... Again, when you're designing these walls, don't just go out and measure and go, okay, we got 400 square feet, I'm charging 50 bucks square foot, whatever it is. Uh, you gotta really do your diligence when it comes to the soils. Anybody have a trick that they use or a, a method when they go out on a job to identify if that soil is gonna be problematic, if it's sandy or if it's heavy clay? I can usually tell real fast. I don't have to put a shovel in the ground. I just have to ask one question. How often do you water your lawn? If, if their grass is super green and they water once a week, I know they have heavy clay because that, that ground is holding moisture in. If they say, we water twice a day, 
and their grass looks like, you know, brown crap everywhere, you know, whatever. I know they're in super sandy soil, and I'm sorry it sucks to keep your grass green, but this is great for me. This is what I want to build in. So uh, that's just a cheap, again, dirty field trick that you can use to identify soils, uh, you know, spitball approach, so to speak. But it seems to be fairly, fairly accurate and fairly true. So that's one question I always ask, how often do you guys water, you know? Why do you care? You're not here to look at the irrigation, I know, but I could explain it to you. And some people like to hear it, some people you can immediately see the lights shut off, <laughs> they don't care. But uh, for, for guys that are in our industry, it's, it's good information, I think. So again, six inch leveling pad, aggregate for drainage. Think about your soils, make sure your compaction is done proper. So this is gonna be some of the same information, but some new stuff injected here as well. Uh, so we're building a four foot wall. I think that's eight rows of block there. You know, six inches a piece, one embedded. Uh, this is again where we're seeing that fee angle because this yellow material right here is only being held up by the weight of these blocks. There's no additional uh, soil reinforcement or structural integrity behind this wall. It's just a wedge, a pie-shaped wedge of unstable soil. That's why if this wall fails, whoops, there we go. So again, different, different soils, different materials. But if this wall fails, you're only gonna see the shear plane fall off and slump off. The rest of that material is gonna stay put. And that's what I see, you know, when I see a filled wall, I see a, a pile of material, it's not a huge washing, it's not, it's not the whole hillside, it's just that unstable wedge that, that washes out. And that's again why we've got that four foot rule because when you look at how this wedge works and you, you think about the volume Right down here, this is just a teeny little triangle. And then up here, that same one foot section of wall is holding up quite a bit more material if you break this into lines, right? By the time you get to the top, that's a large volume. So if you add just one foot onto this wall, you might be adding a third to the load, right? On a four foot wall, five foot wall, you can't just add one foot to these walls. They will fail. As, you, as that fee angle goes back, it goes to infinity. That never ends. So the taller your wall, the larger the unstable wedge is gonna be. So this is that graphic that, it, that we were just kind of talking about here. So that red area right there, that's the area that, yeah, Miss Jones, I can put another foot on your wall. Problem is, I didn't plan ahead for it. I have no geogrid behind the wall, but I mean, it's 100 feet long. I can just stack it up easy. That's an extra, you know, 100 square feet for me at 50 bucks square foot. It's not a bad day at the office. It's really tempting to add that foot to the wall. If you do that, you need to understand that you're adding, you know, maybe what, 20% to the overall height, but you might be adding 40% to the load that the wall's carrying. So be very careful about adding to these walls. So there we go, we're gonna see that unstable wedge eventually have its way with the wall. And you end up with something like that, right? Uh, lots of stuff going on in this picture. I can tell, what's the first mistake these guys made? It's not Versalock, right? It's, a, it's, another, it's another manufacturer, but uh, you know, core fill, yeah, it looks like the core fill's there. You know, as, as you kind of reverse CSI, you reverse engineer some of these failures, you start looking and I'm like, okay, I see, I see core fill. I see some drain rock, but I don't see enough. You know, like I, I can tell they didn't do a full one foot stack behind this wall. I don't see a drain tile. I see that the wall is much higher than the soil behind it, which tells me that they didn't probably compact properly. I don't see geogrid. This wall's over four feet. Looks like less than perfect conditions. So, you know, it's like the sinking of the Titanic, right? It's, it's, it's not just an iceberg that sank Titanic. A bunch of things had to go wrong leading up to that iceberg. And it's the same thing with these retaining walls. 
one thing, you know, you do one tiny thing wrong, it may not cause a failure, but you start to compound problems like this and you can guarantee failure on your wall. All right, so we're gonna pull that top foot back off. And then we're gonna add a, a, a what we call a load slope, or a, a top slope. Now, again, we talked about that three to one ratio. That means over three linear feet, you can only have one foot of vertical rise or drop. That's a three to one ratio. And that's what engineers in Minnesota have said is sustainable. So let's max that slope out at three to one. Look at how much extra material is back there. And again, that's why it's so important to understand uh, what you're looking at because without that slope behind there, it's just fine at four feet. You know, the yellow stuff, that's, that's gonna be reinforced or held in place by the block, the weight of the block, that 125 pounds per square foot. But when you double the load, that block's not designed for that, right? So adding a load slope, you might double or more the load that that wall is expected to carry. And of course, it's gonna become unstable and we're gonna see another failure. That is a lot of Budweiser if you have to go back and rebuild these walls and, and clean it all up and haul in new backfill. And you know, like I said, if, if you glued your caps on with, <clears throat> with a, uh, a block adhesive that doesn't release, uh, Versalock's got a specific cap uh, silicone uh, sealant type of glue that, that's designed to release so that if you ever do need to add on or repair a wall, it will let go. I would never use it on stair treads, but um, if you're using a glue on there, you're probably gonna break caps, you're gonna be buying caps, but the main thing again is the labor. Uh, all the owners in here know that that's one of the main costs of doing business this coming year. Uh, you know, pay scales are just are getting off the charts. So labor is the most expensive part of doing the repair on these walls. It's a nice little Chevy truck. Uh, how many of you guys have seen the video of the Tesla pulling the Ford F-150? Have you seen that where they tie off to the back and the uh, electric Tesla pulls the Ford? That's because it weighs twice as much, right? So I wouldn't park a Tesla that close to the retaining wall. Uh, and even this truck, I think we're gonna see fall after failure. And what this is getting across is this is what we'd call a, uh, a live load, okay? So that truck's a live load. Why is it a live load? Because it moves, it's not dead, it's, it's, it's uh, dynamic, it's gonna move. So that load needs to be planned for differently than a dead load. You know, like say you got a propane tank that sits up there, you know, and it weighs 8,000 pounds, whatever. That's a dead load, a building, a uh, tree. You know, all these things are dead loads. Live loads are gonna be, you know, parking lots. Uh, if you're doing a, I mean, hell, air, airport tarmac, whatever, that's a live load. So that's a different engineering spec. Again, we don't need to get into all the specifics uh, of what the differences are. We just need to understand that there are differences and trust the engineer to, uh, to make sure that he's uh, helping us plan for those. So different units have different heights that you can build to. And you know, again, talked about the 125 pounds per square foot on Versalock. The square foot block, uh, Jimmy, what does that weigh, 85 pounds? The square foot block is 100 pounds? What about non-DOT? Little, little over 90. So the difference between the square foot block and the standard Versalock, if, if a square foot block weighs 90 and a block and a half of Versalock weighs 125, that's 35 pound per square foot difference in weight. So that means that wall or that block is gonna be capable of holding back a lot less. When you core fill it, you do add weight to it and that adds stability and structural integrity to it. So I don't know, Jimmy, do you, do you know what those weigh once they're core filled? Probably pretty close. It doesn't get quite as much. So even with a core fill, a square foot block, is still gonna weigh a little bit less per square foot at the face. Um, and that's why all these blocks are different. You know, some of the like little Menards blocks, you've seen that, I think they call them Windsor blocks. They're like four, four inches tall, 
12 wide and eight deep. I think they weigh like 23 pounds a piece. You know, it takes like five of those though, or four of those or whatever to be a square foot. Um, you still, because it's only eight inches deep, you're never gonna hit that 125 pounds per square foot at the face, which means those walls, and if you read close, those little Windsor blocks are really only designed to go like two feet tall. They're, they're really just ornamental garden walls, you know? So I cringe a little bit whenever I see those things, you know, six feet tall and they're always bowing and they're never capped and whatever. It's always a DIY thing. But, but again, different blocks are gonna have different thresholds for height. And Versalock kind of exceeds most of those, uh, most of the competitors when it comes to weight. Not a lot of blocks are manufactured solid like Versalock. A lot of them do have some kind of a core fill or they've got some sort of, you know, I've seen indents where it's almost like a Lego, you know, like some way of reducing weight, right? Sometimes they found a clever way to tie together uh, reducing weight with some sort of a physical interlock where it becomes part of the key system or whatever it might be. But just know that if you're building with a smaller block or a core fill block, don't plan on going four feet tall. We talked about this earlier. This is again why I like to set my base row leaning back into the hillside just a little bit. I just wanna make sure that the opposite's not happening. And if this base block is tipped forward, you're starting your retaining wall's life with a lot of uh, uh, problems right off the bat, right? So, I mean, this is like not a good start to a wall. You wanna make sure that you have it tipping back, if anything. Vertical's fine. All of the engineering specs that you read are designed for that three-quarter setback. As long as you match or exceed that, you're doing just fine. So lots of ways to sturdy up your wall. You can use a heavier, deeper unit. That's what we have over here with these Rosetta blocks. Uh, geez, Rosetta, I think in perfect conditions, is CJ still here? I think you can go like six or eight feet, right? Is it eight? I think it's eight feet. So these Rosetta blocks, they weigh more. They're deeper, they're heavier, they're more stable because they're two feet deep. You know, machine set, it's just a different animal. They're also a lot more expensive, right? There's, so there's a trade-off, but, um, you can build up to eight feet unreinforced with the Rosetta outcropping. The Rosetta Belvedere, I wouldn't go more than two feet with that because it's eight inches deep. There's just not enough weight uh, to hold that together. And again, with these Broncos, the thing I've been holding myself up with all day, you know, they're so heavy that you can go eight, maybe 10 feet re unreinforced. 15, 15. So that's a really tall wall with no geogrid. What does that mean to me? If I'm using a thicker block like Rosetta, I care because that means I'm gonna have to displace a lot less material. I'm not gonna have to dig back 10 feet to get my grid links in. I can cut back three feet. I can build my wall vertical, get my one foot of drain rock behind it, take it to the bank, I'm done, right? And that's a ton of time to move that material. So when I might switch, say, from like a Versalock to a Rosetta, is say I'm in a really cramped area, right? It's really tight, I, I just can't even dig back. If I dig back what I need to get my grid lengths, I'm taking out the neighbor's fence or his garage or something else, doesn't matter. But that's when I might start to look at, you know, a Bronco or a, a Rosetta that I can build vertical with without doing the, the uh, geo grid. Maybe I don't have room to stage all that material and then put it back in. You know, there's, just, there's lots of variables. So you can always increase the height of the wall by increasing the weight and the uh, stability of the unit. So we talked about how site conditions, loads, slopes, soils, SRW uh, properties, 82 pounds a block, 125 pounds per square foot. I think some of that stuff might be on the NCMA test. Um, but know that these are the primary contributors to planning out a wall and making sure that you're not gonna see a failure. We'll run through grid. I know we already talked about it a little bit. Uh, there are two types of grid. One is unidirectional and one is bi-directional. Typically, the higher gradation of grid 
you're going to move into what we call a unidirectional grid. In other words, you can only roll it out in one direction. You can't roll it out down the length of the wall. 1.5 you can. 1.5 only comes in four foot wide rolls. It's the lightest, it's like a geo grid, diet geo grid, right? It's, it's just the lightest variety that you can get. You might use that on your three foot wall that, that's carrying a load slope or a surcharge kind of a thing. Probably not going to use it on taller walls. So again, we've seen this, you roll it back, the weight of the units, sandwich it in there. And this is where we're gonna kinda see how GeoGrid ties these elements together. All these different components from the drain rock to the backfill, you know, whether it be reinforced or unreinforced, to the block, the pins, the base, it all works together. Uh, every finger has to work to make a fist, so to speak. So uh, all these components come together to create an incredibly stable system that does work as long as you know what to look for. So again, we're looking at these grid lengths, right? Let's use the scenario that I was talking about uh, before. Well, we'll talk about this first. So, so what the GeoGrid has done here is it's turned that wedge into a large solid block. All the soil between the grid is considered stabilized soil or reinforced soil. So you actually bump that yellow wedge back. But now what you've done, look at this. I mean, now you've got five feet behind the retaining wall of you know, reinforced uh, material. That, that weight and that material, as long as it's reinforced, becomes part of the strength of your wall. So it can withstand that yellow wedge behind it no problem, right? Because we've added that much mass to our structure. We didn't do it with concrete, we just did it with GeoGrid. And uh, this stuff is, is miraculous. We've got, we've got all kinds of data on it and there's a couple of, uh, maybe we'll do the, the sand test later, a couple of uh, visuals that we do that really help to drive home how important GeoGrid is. So when it says not a traditional tieback, it means it's not a dead man anchor per se. It's you know dead man anchor 2.0, whatever. It's uh, it's just a, a a newer, better way of reinforcing the soil behind our wall. And again, it creates one solid uh, structure there to hold the hillside back. So you can see now the volume of our reinforced backfill far exceeds that little yellow wedge, which means we are off to a great start. We're not gonna see failure on that wall. If you break it into the micro, you know, you look at the macro there and you got that big yellow wedge, if you diagnose it a little bit further and you see how those small yellow wedges come together, if you remove the block, that is what you're gonna see. And that's, again, the ziggurat, right? Uh, that's when you see the different layers. And this is a great picture to pop up right here because what does that look like? It looks exactly like those little yellow wedges that we just saw on the graphic, right? So thousands of years ago, they had it figured out. They were doing it uh, same way we do it today. So we're using synthetic stuff. They were probably using hay or some sort of a mesh weave. But it's 260 feet tall and it's been there for 3,000 years. So. Anybody got a 3,000 year warranty on their walls? Obviously the technology works. So uh, again, this is a general rule, but grid lengths are gonna be a minimum of 60% of the height of the wall. So if you got a 10 foot wall, your grid length's gonna be about six feet. And again, this is like perfect conditions. Trust your engineer, follow the spec. Uh, but as a general rule, 60% of the height of the wall. And for NCMA people, that's uh, something you wanna make a note of. Reinforced walls uh, that have a slope, that's a load slope I call that, and the same thing is true with a toe slope, it could be 100% or more of the height of the wall. So if you're building a 20 foot wall, you better bid, you know, do your volume calculations, find out how much dirt you're gonna be moving because you're gonna have to move it somewhere off site. You know, maybe you can fit it in the yard, but you're gonna be putting it back too. So you're gonna move that soil twice. And you're not just gonna dump it in, you're gonna dump it in in lifts, and then you're gonna compact it all the way up. So you're handling it, you're handling it a lot. Make sure you're charging for that, because that's, uh, 
that could increase the, the cost of a retaining wall by 75, 80%. I mean, it's just a lot of machine time. So make sure you're bearing in mind, if you got a wall that's 10 feet tall, you got a slope or a load, you're gonna probably have to move, you know, maybe 100 yards of, of material and then put it back carefully. So, so make sure you're bidding that in there. Uh, this is, uh, you know, using the example that I talked about, Zeta, let's say that you've got a, a yard, you know, you're in St. Paul, there's a garage, you can't dig back the, the 10 feet that the engineer said you need for that grid in order to stabilize the wall, you just don't have room for it. So you're like, you know, instead of using three 10 foot sections, I'm gonna use six, you know, four foot sections, whatever. I'm gonna cut my grid length in half, but I'm gonna use more layers. It's not the same thing. And you'll see why here. So if I cut off a foot on my grid lengths, now you can see my top layer of grid just barely touching that uh, sustainable slope or that reinforced soil, barely touching it. So if I hug it in a little further, you can see now the top half of that wall, remember the wall we saw that was leaning back on itself? You know, that, that might be something that I would expect to see with this scenario, right? Because the grid's just not getting back into the stabilized soil, it's not reinforced. If you start to lose a little bit due to erosion, it's gonna pull the top half of the wall back. So uh, shortening up grid lengths and doubling up on the layers is not a replacement. It's not gonna work the same just because you're putting the same amount of square footage uh, into your, into your uh, backfill. It's not the same, it's not a replacement. So if, if it calls for eight feet, use eight feet. Eventually you get so short that there's just no point in doing it at all, right? So now we've got that huge red slope behind there. There's just not enough mass to hold it. Again, we talk a little bit about global stability, but that's where you start to see some uh, global stabilization issues. You get that divot in there, you're gonna push water behind the wall, and again, it's a domino effect. Uh, this thing's just waiting to hit an iceberg. All right, so there we go. That wall hit an iceberg, it's done. If you use a weaker grid, you know, we talked about that, you can't use that orange silt fencing, you can't use weed fabric, you know, I mean, seen all kinds of crazy stuff out there. Just use the right grid. It's, it's, uh, it's cheap insurance against failure. I'd, I'd rather pay, and believe me, I, I'm a penny pincher. I was just talking to a guy out there, and I'm like, you know, when I was running job sites, like, I, I hate seeing pins laying on the floor. You, know, you pay 20 cents a piece or whatever for those, and, you know, the guys don't care. They're pinning blocks, and they're dropping them all over the place, and it's like, well, there's 10 bucks laying there on the ground. You know, let's pick that up, right? So I'm always pinching pennies, but don't pinch here. Buy GeoGrid, buy the right stuff, buy the right block, buy the right grid, get an engineer involved. Eventually you'll snap that fake GeoGrid, and once you snap your GeoGrid, you've lost all of your soil stabilization, and you're gonna see failure. This is one mistake that I probably see made more often than any other uh, retaining wall issue, and this is just building tiers too close together, right? Uh, lots of reasons not to do this. I would definitely, I'd prefer to have this be one wall, but I know, I get it. Miss Jones wants a garden and she's got deer or whatever, and the wall's gonna be tall enough so the deer can't eat her tomatoes. Who cares what it is, right? I just want a little three foot garden section there. Well, it's real tempting to give her that, and you can, but know that you're gonna have to grid that bottom wall, because if you don't grid that bottom wall, this top wall is built in the failure plane of the lower wall. So eventually that weight is gonna overcome the bottom wall's ability to withstand it. So you can see here, two to one ratio. So whatever that exposed height is, you don't include your embedment. So if you got a three foot wall and you've got six inches embedded, you don't have to go back seven feet, you have to go back six feet. So whatever the exposed height of the base wall is, go back twice that. And again, you can give Miss Jones the tomato garden of her dreams. Uh, you know, you can get grid in there and then create a stable section so that you can build a second wall on top of it. But if you don't put the geo grid in there, uh, again, you're, you're just creating a large unstable wedge and that's why we say stick to that two to one ratio as a general rule 
And you know that two to one ratio is just like everything else we've talked about. It's subject to change based on environmental factors, right? So what kind of soils you have, slopes, all that stuff. Slopes at the top of the wall, we talked about that, how it takes that, that wedge and turns it into infinity. That wedge goes on forever. So the taller your wall, the more volume, unreinforced volume, you're trying to hold back. That's why when you introduce a uh, load slope, you're gonna have to introduce some kind of geogrid to lock everything together and reinforce it. Same thing is true on the toe. And that's why we saw that schematic earlier where on a flat surface, you only need 10% embedment. On a toe slope, you might need up to 15 or 20% embedment. So you have to make sure that you're identifying these as, as potential issues. I hate building into toe slopes because it makes everything dangerous and uh, difficult on the low side of the wall. I'm almost always if I come in with a machine and I'm doing the excavation, I'm almost always gonna cut a bench in there so that I got some flat space to work, right? Maybe a 10 foot bench in there. That way I can drive my skid back and forth. I don't have to worry about every time I set a pallet down, the top row slides off and breaks Joe's leg in half and, and all that other stuff. So, you know, you create a flat bench, but what you do when you do that is you're creating an unstable wedge, right? So you know eventually if you just left that bench, it would erode down and hit that fee angle or that shear plane eventually. So you have to know that going into it too. You're gonna to have to return to the toe slope even though you create a temporary bench. So you're never gonna get rid of it, but at least while you're working, uh, it is nice to do a bench cut so that you got a flat place to work from, just safety stuff. So here we go. Uh, we talked a little, little bit about global stability. It's not something that's gonna be covered heavily on the NCMA test. Uh, but I think we're gonna get into that here in a, in a slide or two. So you can see with a toe slope here, even with the reinforced volume, you still have to go deeper with your embedment. If you do the same thing that you would do on a flat surface, you're gonna experience global instability where the bottom wants to start to slide out a little bit. And that's what we're seeing here is that your whole wall can lock together. And I've seen pictures of this. I've never had it happen to one of my walls, but I have seen pictures of walls built into a hillside. Like, you know, it's the house on the hill, right? The one way up at the top. And they got a retaining wall a third of the way down their hill. I've seen a whole wall stick together and slide down 100 feet. You know, like it'll, it'll still look decently put together. It's still pinned, you know, the caps are still attached. The whole thing just phew, global instability. So. You can, you can counter that with either longer grid or a deeper embedment. So you can kind of see how these walls will slide around a little bit. It's saying here, you know, the engineer's gonna have to lengthen your grid, cut back into that stable slope. Okay, so um, before we jump into the summary, you know, for any test takers or, or just guys that have, any, anybody have questions on anything they've seen in the engineering section? There will be a test, no, I'm just kidding, it's voluntary, but um, yeah, if you have any questions, you can see me uh, after here as well. So, you know, just to summarize, uh, we've talked about, you know, what goes into the wall, the different components, how the, the fingers make a fist together. They have to all be there. If you're missing one finger, it's not a full fist. Uh, so make sure that all the components are working together. Importance of geogrid, soil reinforcement. When I first got into retaining walls, it seemed like voodoo. I'm like looking at these concrete blocks and then I'm looking at this little roll of like saran wrap and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, you want me to put that in behind there and you're telling me it matters? Well, it matters dramatically and it makes a huge, huge difference, believe it or not. Kinda seems like, uh, you know, magic or voodoo, like I said, but that geogrid, it's been, it's been being used for and utilized for thousands of years to reinforce all kinds of stuff. I mean, you look at uh, ancient Aztecs, mines, all of them use the same, same engineering technique. Don't be afraid to call for help. Um, you know, it's just like anything else. Uh, these guys, and, and that's one thing that really got me going with Verslock when I was getting started is there is not a better support structure in the industry. 
most companies, and I'm not gonna name names, you guys, I'm sure you guys have all used competitors, but most companies have one rep for like the entire Midwest region, right? And you don't see that guy unless A, there's a massive problem with one of the products, or B, you know, you're a big company and you're putting in a, a 20,000 square foot driveway or a parking lot, whatever, maybe that rep will visit you for a day. These guys bring Gatorade to the job sites. You can call them with questions. Sometimes they'll bring you beer. Uh, you can call them with questions, you can call them with concerns, and, and uh, you won't get a better staff of guys anywhere in the industry that I've, se I've seen. Uh, and that's one thing that really got me going with Verslock was the fact that, you know, look, there's a lot of times you have questions on sites. I haven't seen everything, I'm green, I've been doing it for a couple years. These guys have been selling block and dealing with structural retaining walls for, you know, probably a combined century. There's just so much experience in this room. So use that as a resource. If you're buying from them, they're happy to help. They don't want to see their walls fail. You know, that's the last thing you want to see is a big, big uh, Versalock wall falling down right off 494 and poor Jimmy's got to drive by it every day on his way to work and he's just hanging his head in shame, right? So these guys want to be there for you. They want to help you learn, train you. If you have tricks of the trade that you've learned that you think are speeding you up or making you, uh, you know, more efficient, share it with them. It's not a proprietary thing. I don't have to hope that you fail for me to win. Right, and that's one thing I think we, we sometimes forget. I do a lot of networking with other companies. I love working with other companies. I want all of us to win. There's plenty of money out there, plenty of business. We can all work together, sharpen each other, right? So, so that's one thing that I really like about Verslock is that they create that team atmosphere where uh, guys aren't showing up and puffing out their chest and trying to impress everybody else. It's like, you know, let's be a team. We're all in the same, it's hard work. Right? You, you gotta be a special kind of guy. I've had so many guys come in and wash out day one. It's hard work. It's, you know, schlepping block and, and all that stuff. Some guys just aren't built for it. So, you know, uh, we're, we're a big extended family or a team, however you wanna look at it, right? So let's, let's help each other, support each other, use your local reps. Uh, they're a great resource. Drainage and compaction. So uh, that pretty much, does it, leave the engineering to engineers, just make sure that you know uh, some of the red flags to look for. Like I said, one red flag, maybe you don't have to call, but two red flags, three, four, five, it starts to compound, call somebody.